Is there an American girl? Made in the world court. Escaping from or doing away with capitalism, I was wondering what scheme, workable scheme, you would put in its place. Me? Or uh, well, others? what I would, yeah. <laughs> what, well, what would you, know, you I, suggest to others who might be in a position yeah. to set it up and get it going? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, what used to be called centuries ago wage slavery is intolerable. I mean, I don't think people ought to be forced to rent themselves in order to survive. I think that the economic institutions ought to be run democratically by their participants, by the communities in which they exist, and so on. And uh, I think basically through various kinds of free association. Historically, have there been any uh, sustained examples on any substantial scale of uh, societies which approximated to the anarchist ideal? There are small societies uh, small in number, that have, I think, done so quite well. And there are a few examples of large-scale uh, libertarian revolutions which were largely anarchist in their structure. Uh, as to the first, small societies ex extending over a long period, I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, which for a long period, may or may not be true today, really were constructed on anarchist principles, that is, of direct worker control, integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life on an egalitarian basis with direct and in fact quite active participation in self-management and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful. A good example of a really large-scale anarchist revolution or largely anarchist revolution, in fact the best example to my knowledge is the Spanish Revolution in 1936 and in fact uh, you can't tell what would have happened. That anarchist revolution was simply destroyed by force, but during the period in which it was alive, I think it was uh, inspiring testimony to the ability of uh, poor working people to uh, organize, manage uh, their affairs extremely successfully without coercion and control. How far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way of life really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication? I think it not only depends on it, but in fact the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation. Precisely that kind of great transformation in, uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire, precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation. You've written that in looking at contributions of gifted thinkers, one must make sure to understand their contributions, but also to eliminate the errors in them. Um, and of your ideas, what would you guess would be discarded and what would be assimilated by future thinkers? Well, I mean, I would assume virtually everything would be discarded. Uh, for example, in 
uh, here, here we have to distinguish. I mean, the work that I do in my professional area, I mean, if I still believed what I believed 10 years ago, I'd assume the field is dead. Uh, so I assume that when next time you read a student's paper, you're going to see something that has to be changed and you continue to make progress. In dealing with social and political issues, in my view, what is at all understood is pretty straightforward. I don't think that there, there may be deep and complicated things, but if so, they're not understood. Uh, the, uh, uh, the basic ways, to the extent that we understand society at all, it's pretty straightforward. And I don't think that those simple understandings are likely to undergo much change. Uh, the point is that you have to work. And that's why, that's why the propaganda system is so successful. Uh, very few people are going to have the time or the energy or the commitment to carry out the constant battle that's required to get outside of, uh, you know, McNeil there or, or uh, you know, Dan Rather or somebody like that. The easy thing to do, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you just had a busy day, you know, you're not going to spend the evening carrying out a research project. So you turn on the tube and say it's probably right, you know. Or you look at the headlines in the paper and then you watch the sports or something. Because uh, and, and that's, that's basically the way the system of indoctrination works. Sure, the other stuff is there, but you're going to have to work to find it. Modern industrial civilization has developed within a certain system of convenient myths. The driving force of modern industrial civilization has been individual material gain. Uh, which is accepted as legitimate, uh, even praiseworthy, on the grounds that uh, private vices yield public benefits in the classic formulation. Now, it's long been understood very well that a society is, that is based on this principle will destroy itself in time. It can only persist with whatever suffering and injustice it entails as long as it's possible to pretend uh, that the destructive forces that humans create are limited, uh, that the world is an infinite resource, and that the world is an infinite garbage can. At this stage of history, either one of two things is possible. Either the general population will take control of its own destiny and will concern itself with community interests, guided by values of solidarity, and sympathy and concern for others, or alternatively, there will be no destiny for anyone to control. As long as some specialized class is in a position of authority, it is going to set policy in the special interests that it serves. But the conditions of survival, let alone justice, require rational social planning in the interests of the community as a whole, and by now that means the global community. The question is whether privileged elites should dominate mass communication and should use this power as they tell us they must, namely to impose necessary illusions, to manipulate and deceive the stupid majority and remove them from the public arena. The question in brief is whether democracy and freedom are values to be preserved or threats to be avoided. In this possibly terminal phase of human existence, democracy and freedom are more than values to be treasured, they may well be essential to survival. Thank you. He's up there thinking for himself, and he's deciphering this tremendously overweighted body of information, which he puts into an order, and gives you the feeling that you can do the same thing, that the whole thing is decipherable. And he also gives you the sense that there is a source, there's a center to the, um, to a dissenting population, although we feel that there's no center. And I think that is what re reactivated in me um, a desire to get back, get reacquainted with the political scene after 30 years of alienation from it. You do hundreds of interviews and lectures, and I'm, and you're dealing with massacres in East Timor and, and uh, invasions of Panama, etc. Pretty horrific stuff, death squads. What keeps you going? I mean, don't you get burned out on this material? Uh, well, you know, it's mainly a matter of whether you can look yourself in the mirror, I think. Oh, gotta go. 
get these big boards out. Okay. Maybe you can okay. save all the board for us. Okay. There's a train of coming somewhere down the track. The people who ain't ready better step in back. This train has been running since all time began. Is running on the love of your fellow man. All the boys. Good to see you. you Just hit the microphone. Bye, Canada. Goodbye, Canada. Bye, 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 Canada.